Good morning. Why don't you grab a Bible? You find a Bible in the seat in front of you. If you're down here on the floor, you'll find one underneath your seat if you're up in our stadium seating. And let's look at the passage that was just read to us. It's on page 837. 837. Mark chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 13. See this candle right here? As Trevor was sharing about candles, this, this candle is important to me. This candle is someone in my small group who has heard the good news and has chosen to respond to that good news. And you know what's interesting? Every one of those candles over there represents somebody's, someone that we love, we care about, someone who's important to us. And so we celebrate together what God is doing. We have two fall initiatives that I shared with you three weeks ago and we've been talking about. Who's your one? Who's that person that you love and that you care about that's important to you? A person you'd be willing to rearrange your life to be with and who are far from God, and that you are so glad that you're in their life and they are in your life. And then we talked about what does it mean to have spiritual conversations with people? What does it mean to talk about spiritual things? Well, we wanna help you, we wanna coach you, so we wanna show you a couple of ways not to do it. So take a look up here. You guys see this? This is awesome. What? What? So I found this video on YouTube of every Jay Cutler interception ever. Oh my gosh. But bro, I gotta ask you a question. Do you know who the greatest quarterback of all time is? Yeah, Tom Brady. No. It's Jesus Christ. And he is gonna take you to the greatest We hope that helps. We hope that helps. What does it mean to have spiritual conversations, good spiritual conversations? Let me tell you about one this week. One of my ones, a guy that I really care about and, and been pursuing and know, and a smart, clever man. This week he called me. He wanted to set up a lunch very quickly with me. And so I rearranged my Thursday in order for us to be able to have lunch together. And we've been talking about spiritual things now over a period of time. And, he starts the lunch, we get our lunches, and he starts the lunch by going, I want to finish where we started, stopped last time. What do you mean you can't live like Jesus? What do you mean by that? Because the last time we're together, he said to me, he goes, listen, I want to live like Jesus, I'm just not ready to believe in Jesus. And I said to him, you can't live like Jesus. So that's where he wanted to start. And so we picked up our conversation that you can't live like Jesus unless the spirit of Jesus is in you. And we had this great conversation. What does it mean for us to pursue and to initiate and talk about spiritual things with people that we care about. And I wanna make sure that we keep that on the forefront of our thinking. Today, at the end of the service, if we have questions, we are gonna do some texting. Texting is an opportunity for you to be able to ask questions about the message, a point of clarity, or maybe a question just curious that comes come up in your small group or whatever, in whatever place. And the way you ask questions here at Park is in your text app, you put in the phone number 62953, 62953, and then in the body of the text, you must put ask in in. You must put ask in in, or it won't get to us. And you'll know it works because you should get a text back from us. All right, let me pray. We'll jump in. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity for us to gather, and we invite you into this space. Father, we know you're here because you're everywhere all the time. But we're mindful that in that invitation, we're asking you to speak to us, whisper in our ear, nudge us in our heart. Father, we know that when your word is proclaimed, you tell us in Isaiah 55 that it is not returned to you void without you accomplishing your agenda in the hearts of people. So we trust that again in this moment. And because of that, I would pray that what's of me and not of you would quickly be forgotten so I wouldn't confuse anyone. 
Father, we also pray that James would be true for us. As James says, that we would not be merely hearers of your word in this moment, but we would hear what you're saying. We would be convicted, encouraged by, prompted, and we would act. We'd be doers of your word. Now, with our heads bowed, let me give you a moment to pray. Maybe your prayer this morning is simply this. Father God, speak to me. I am listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Look down with me at verse 13. It says, Jesus is walking along the seashore, and a crowd has gathered around him, possibly because of all that he has been teaching and has been doing, like raising the paralytic, like Jason talked about last week. Let me show you a picture where this whole this time period, last week, this week, is taking place. This is Capernaum. On the left-hand side is an artist's rendition based on the archaeological finds, and on the right is a part of Capernaum. What you see circled is the synagogue, which would be the center of religious and spiritual life. The center of the community is what you see there in both of those. So Jesus is in Capernaum, and he's walking along the seashore, and people are gathered around. He's got a crowd. But as he goes a little bit of a distance, he comes across a tax booth, it says. A tax booth. Now let me explain to you what a tax booth is. A tax booth is where they gather taxes on major thoroughfares, major highways. Like every time you cross a county line, like we understand counties, they would take a tax. Let me show you a map of what this road would have been. It's the Via Marius, and you see yellow is the minor. They're easier to see, but the red line, right by the white arrow, went from Damascus all the way down to Egypt. Very, very popular route where people had to come and go. And so there was a tax booth right at this county line by Capernaum. And Jesus comes to this tax booth to have a conversation, a very short conversation, with a tax collector named Levi. Now, Levi is really short for Levite. Levi is one of the 12 tribes of Israel. There is a man who had 12 sons, and from these sons, we have these 12 tribes, and the Levites were the tribes for the priests. They were the religious leaders and the religious they were musicians, and they were guards for the temple, and they were also the priests for the temple. So this fact that he is a Levite stands out as a double no-no for him to be a tax collector. See, tax collectors were hated, hated, because they were Jewish people who were working for the invading army, the Romans. And the Romans were harsh. They demanded a lot. And for each territory, they would determine, here's how much money we need from this territory. One, to supply the soldiers with food and housing, but also for roads and civic duties, any number of things. And the way tax work is that the tax collector would ask you for a certain amount, and then he would probably double it, because what he got on top of that certain amount is what he lived on. So if he asked you for a denarius, which is a day's wage, that would be the tax. He would charge you two, and he would take that second one for himself. Made you very wealthy to be a tax collector, but it made you hated, because they saw you as a collaborator. They saw you as someone who was against your own people. And here's this guy named Levi, who was part of the priestly tribe, who was working for the Romans. He was doubly hated. His name was really Matthew, and we know that because in the Gospel of Matthew, written by this guy from this story, he describes himself as Matthew the Levite. Mark just chooses to call him a Levite. You know what? Tax collectors were so hated and so distrusted that they couldn't even serve as witnesses in a court because you couldn't take them at their word. And it wasn't just the tax collector who was ostracized. It was also his wife and his children because he was a tax collector. He couldn't be invited to any of the things at the synagogue, which I told you was the center of religious life, really the center, the emotional center for any of uh, any community, any city like Capernaum, he was not invited. And Jesus comes along and he sees this man sitting in a tax booth with, surrounded by Roman soldiers because the Roman soldiers were there to do his bidding. If you didn't do what he wanted, if you didn't give the tax that he demanded, all he had to do is turn around and look at one of these Roman guards. They would either force it from you, they would throw you in jail. They would sell your property. But one way or the other, they were going to get this tax. Tax collectors were spit on. They were cursed. They were damned. And here comes this rabbi with a group of guys with him who stops and speaks to him. 
It is probably the first religious leader who speaks to him in any kind way other than to curse him or to spit on him. And Jesus comes along and he says the very same thing that Steve told us that he said to Peter and Andrew, follow me, follow me. And Matthew gets up and immediately he follows Jesus. Now we don't know what happened before. We can only speculate why Matthew was ready to leave it all and to follow Jesus. It could have been that he had been exposed to John the Baptist's ministry. And we talked about that three weeks ago where John the Baptist came proclaiming a baptism of repentance. It could have been that he was one of those tax collectors that has this brief conversation with John. We'll put it up here, Luke 3, verse 12. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, John the Baptist, teacher, what shall we do? And John the Baptist said to them, collect no more than you are authorized to do. True repentance, John is saying, the true indication that you're repenting and you are turning back to God is that you will take no more than you are supposed to take. Well, that isn't going to be very lucrative. That isn't going to be very helpful for him. And so maybe Matthew, or Matthew the Levite, as he's wrestling with this, this call from John about repentance, maybe he's going, yeah, you know, it's time. And so when Jesus says, follow me, he's up and moving. Maybe, maybe he heard about all the things going on in Capernaum, that a man with a demon was cast out and the man is sitting there in his right mind, or that Peter's mother-in-law was healed and many others came that evening and were healed. Or maybe he heard about the paralytic and he knew one of the friends that dropped the man through the roof that Jason talked about last week. We don't know, but all we know is he seemed ready, doesn't he? Because he responds immediately to when Jesus says, follow me, follow me. Now look with me at verse 15. And as he, Matthew, the Levite, reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. Now let me stop there for a moment. Banquets like this, that we're going to talk about in a second, were spectator sports in Jesus' day. You would see all the commotion at someone's house, you would smell the food, and you would begin to make your way over and you would peer over to watch this banquet take place. You know what's interesting? It looks like that Jesus is the initiator of the banquet. Look down with me at the middle part of that sentence, reclining with Jesus. The New Testament was written in a language called Greek. In the Greek language, this seems to indicate that Jesus is the initiator, that Jesus says to Matthew, the Levite, let's throw a party, you invite your friends, knowing full well who's gonna show up. Now, we even know what kind of party it was. This is one of the things I love about the Bible, that it gives us these historical little tidbits. Look again at that word reclining. They were reclining around a, tr a triclinium table. Here's what it looks like. On the right is what someone would build in their home. You see the very large windows. Many times they were built out in a courtyard, and you see the slant, and they would put cushions on there. And the top there is an artist's rendition of what it would have looked like. And the servants would have brought the food into the middle of the table. The last supper that Jesus has with his disciples was at a triclinium table. We'll talk about that when we get to the last part of Mark. And so Jesus comes and he's reclining with a bunch of tax collectors and sinners. Now tax collectors we've already talked about, hated. Who are sinners? Sinners are understood are those that are far from God. Maybe they thought God gave up on them and so now they've given up on God. But for whatever reason, they are no longer accepted and included in the religious circle of the day. They wouldn't have been invited to the synagogue. They couldn't go, nor their families. They might be like the nuns today, the N-O-N-E here in America. Those who have said, I don't believe in God anymore. That's exactly who Jesus wants to have a meal with. That's exactly who Jesus is comfortable with as he reclines around this table. Now look at this next verse. And as he reclined around the table in his house, verse 15, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus. Now, who are these? Oh, let's keep going, reclining with Jesus. And for there were many who followed him. Let's look at the next verse. In verse, 17, uh, verse 16, it says, the Pharisees, the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? So these Pharisees show up. Now, who are Pharisees? Because they're gonna come up a whole lot in the book of Mark. Pharisees literally means, the word means to separate, to separate. 
They are a group of people that chose to separate themselves from, from the culture and to live very righteous and devout lives. It's called Shavirim. It means that they had a set of rules, and it was the law. It was the law and all the made-up laws that went around, and we'll talk about that another time as we go through Mark. It's dictated what they ate, who they ate with, what they wore, what they tithe, what they said, how they prayed, all of these things. Now, these were not clergy, as we understand clergy today. These would be lay people who are non-clergy. The scribes were those that are among them that studied the law to help determine the rules for them. Now they come and they look in on this party. They consider Jesus to be one of them. How do I know that? Because they invite Jesus to join them for several meals throughout Jesus' public ministry. So they look at Jesus as someone who's living a devout, righteous, holy life. And so they're surprised by who Jesus is eating with. So they come and they look in the window or they look over the wall and they look around and they see these sinners and tax collectors laying with Jesus. So they don't confront Jesus. Instead, they go to the disciples and they're not really asking a question. This is really a condemnation. Look what he says. Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Really, what's he doing? He shouldn't be doing that. What we get a picture of right here is what the kingdom of God looks like. Remember, the gospel of Mark is all about the king has come. Jesus is the king, and with the king comes the kingdom. And so we're being told in this story, this recording of this true event, we're being told who's included in the kingdom. Remember, we talked about that Jesus comes as the king to proclaim good news. We talked about what good news means, and we talked about this three weeks ago. Let me put it up here on the screen for you. Remember, gospel literally means the proclamation of good news. It's the proclamation that the king has come, that the kingdom has come. It's the proclamation that the king has done a work for us. It is a finished work. It could really be summed up in the word done. It has been done for us. In comparison to religion, which says, what do you need to do? That religion is really advice on how to seek the deity, to know the deity, to be understood and accepted by the deity. Good news is we don't do anything. Something has been done for us. It's the proclamation of this finished work in the life of Jesus. Where religion is a description of things that you need to do. And that is the ongoing battle that Jesus will have with the Pharisees as the book of Mark unfolds. Now Jesus overhears this statement that they make. And he responds, look at verse 17 with me. And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Let me pause. This is a common proverb of the day. Jesus didn't make up this proverb. It was already a proverb that was out there. A proverb means a wise saying. You know, we we know these wise sayings, like there's no gain without pain. By the way, did you know Benjamin Franklin came up with that? Not Nike, okay? Did you know that? Okay. And then Jesus explains it. He tweaks it. He adds this statement. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, this is a very Jewish way of making a statement. And let me see if I can help you understand the statement. He says, I didn't come to call those who think they're well, who think they're righteous, I came to those who are spiritually sick and know they need help. He is speaking to the self-righteous. He is speaking to these Pharisees who see themselves as righteous. And frankly, he's speaking to us today in the church, in the Big C Church, which is the church all over the world. There are many who sit in churches who are like these Pharisees, who are self-righteous. See, self-righteous people think, They can heal themselves. They think that following ethical teaching and living a good life will heal them spiritually. They're not looking for good news. They believe they've already discovered the good news through their own behavior. They don't think they need a savior because they're too busy seeking to save themselves by what they're choosing to do. Self-righteous people in the church may have a great respect for Jesus, see him as a moral and ethical teacher. They may believe that he even died on the cross for sinners. They just don't believe they're one of them. The biggest issue for self-righteous people 
is admitting that they have a spiritual need. They think they're righteous. Now, what is righteousness? Let me see if I can help us understand what is righteousness? What is this idea of holiness that these guys are clinging to? Did you ever shoot archery in high school or middle school? You know, where they take a, a, a target that looks like this and they walk it out 20 paces and put it on a couple of bales of hay in a big open field because you don't want a seventh grader missing with that arrow. And right, you back up and you pull this compound bow and you shoot for the target just hoping you hit anything. You remember those days? Here's what righteousness is. The true biblical definition of righteousness would be every single moment of every single day, of every single week, of every single month, of every single year, hitting the target over and over and over, the center in the bullseye, never missing. That's what righteousness is. That's how the Bible defines righteousness. Never missing, always hitting, every time. Jesus comes along and he does us a deep favor by explaining at another level what it means to be obedient. He speaks for his father when he says, it is not just outward obedience that matters to God the Father, it is also our thoughts and motives behind it. In the Sermon on the Mount, which we talked about a couple years ago, we talked about it is not just what we do, but what we think about things. Remember when Jesus says, if you hate someone in your heart, you have murdered them. And so it's hitting that target every single moment of every single day, of every single week, of every single month, of every single year, your whole life, never missing the target, living and thinking perfectly every moment. That's righteousness. But you know what happens to self-righteous people? Self-righteous people give themselves a mulligan. Self-righteous people give themselves a do-over. Because they know the intent. I was close. I meant this. But they don't give grace to others. They are gracious to themselves, but they are not gracious to others. They hold others to a higher standard than they themselves are willing to live. I hit the target most of the time. See, self-righteous people think righteousness is something that is like this, where we stand in a long line of all humanity, and at the very front of it is Jesus, and where you are in the pecking order is based on your holiness, your righteousness, and at the very back of the line is the head of ISIS and Saddam Hussein, and then we all line up somewhere in here, and self-righteous people know they're not Jesus, but they believe in their top fifth. And what self-righteous people do is they turn around and they look back there and they say to themselves, glad I'm not like them. But Jesus comes along and he says, no, we don't stand in a long line. Instead, he has us all turn to the left. Now we stand shoulder to shoulder. And he goes and stands in the middle and says, the comparison is not against each other. The comparison is against me. For Jesus is the only one who shot the bow and arrow and hit the target every single moment of every single day, of every single week, of every single month, of every single year of his life. That's what righteousness is. Jesus can and will only help those who are willing to admit that they're in spiritual need, that they are spiritually sick, and the self-righteous are blind to their need for Jesus. The self-righteous, the religious, the most spiritual are many times the least interested in grace. They don't see a need for it in their life. They're unwilling to see themselves as someone who has a need for grace. We cannot know the healing hand of Jesus in the work of grace and forgiveness until we're willing to admit we have missed that bullseye over and over and over again. It is not a good life that will save you. It is not a good life that will save you. It is admitting that we are spiritually bad. It is admitting that we are spiritually in need. 
Because the good news, the good news is we are worse than we could ever begin to think that we are, it's possible for us. As bad as we might think we are at times, we are far worse than that. But God's grace is more powerful, more powerful than our sinfulness. Jesus is a better forgiver than you and I are a sinner. Thankfully, there is hope even for the self-righteous one. There is hope even for the self-righteous one. Because what Jesus does for us is he takes his target of perfection and he takes it and he puts it on us and he takes our target of missing over and over again and he takes that upon himself and he carries with him the penalty for our missing, for our not living holy and righteous lives. There is hope for the self-righteous one who is willing to admit, I have missed it, I have missed the target. The Pharisees were confronted with not getting what they expected from Jesus. Because the gospel, this good news, it's upside down and inside out from anything that we had previously understood. Those who think they have found it through their own effort, miss it. And those who think they've missed it because of their own behavior, find it. The self-righteous think they'll be rewarded. Instead, they're confronted. And the tax collectors and the sinners think they'll be rejected. Instead, they're received. The problem with self-righteous people is they tend to avoid and look down upon others who are not like them. And you know what? There's a little bit of self-righteousness in every one of us. Every one of us in this room has some level of self-righteousness. Thankfully, Jesus comes along and he gathers those that others have rejected and he brings them to the table. Which group would you find yourself in? As you look upon this scene with the Pharisees hanging in the window observing or those reclining around the table, what group would you see yourself in? Are you with the tax collectors and sinners knowing that you're undeserving of the grace that God has given you? Or do you stand on the outside as a self-righteous person looking in going, what's he doing with them? It begs the question for us, who do we invite to dinner? If Jesus invites the tax collectors and the sinners, who do you and I invite to dinner? Let me remind you what we looked at a couple of weeks ago in 2 Corinthians 5.18. Paul writes this for us. And look at the combination of the good news and our responsibility in this, in, these, in this passage. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore... Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. What's the role of an ambassador? What's the role of someone who sits on the president's cabinet or the king's council? It's to represent the king. It's to speak on his behalf, to give people a good taste of what the nature and the character of the king is. Don and I, several years ago, had the privilege to meet someone on the cabinet of the king of Jordan through a mutual friend, and we had run into him several times. And I'm telling you, he's quite impressive. A very kind man, a very accepting man. And I had never met the king of Jordan. I've only read about him and seen him on TV. But I got this great understanding in my own mind of what the king was like based on meeting one of the people in his cabinet. We are ambassadors of Christ. People should get a great understanding of who Jesus is from us. We speak for him. We act in his behalf. When people are with us, are we good ambassadors for the king? So who sits around our table? If Jesus shuns the self-righteous and seeks out the tax collectors and sinners, who should be at our table? We invite the unlikely and maybe those who seem unwilling at first. Why? 
Because the gospel reminds us from time to time of what we once were without Jesus. The gospel reminds us of who we are now. We stand in a place where God should hate us. Instead, God loves us. He has pursued us. He has received us. He has accepted us. He has adopted us. He has made us sons and daughters of the king. And the gospel now empowers us to see others as we are now seen. We see others as we are now seen by the king. And the gospel empowers us to receive them. Then why don't we? Then why don't we? Because our dislike, and yes, at times, even our hate of someone repels us from seeking them. Think of the person that you're most unlikely to invite to your house for dinner. The person you're most unlikely to invite. Maybe it's someone who's offended you, hurt you, or offended or hurt someone you love. I'll be honest with you, that's the hardest person to get to my table for me. How about an ISIS fighter? How about Brock Turner from Stanford, the Stanford swimmer who was convicted of sexual assault? Would you invite him to your house for dinner? How about a pedophile? A doctor from an abortion clinic? Would you invite them to your house for dinner? How about the leader in the LGBTQ community? How about Donald Trump? Would you invite Donald Trump to your house for dinner or one of his strong supporters? How about Hillary Clinton? Would you invite Hillary Clinton to your house or one of her supporters? I know many of us are struggling with who to vote for, so I just want you to know I'm declaring right now my write-in candidacy for president of the United States of America. <laughs> my platform, I am not them. That's my point. But if we're honest, that is a very self-righteous statement. <laughs> Would you invite them to your house for dinner? How about a leader in the Black Lives Matter movement? How about a police officer who has shot an unarmed black man? How about the gangbanger who shot this gentleman up in North Rogers Park? Would you invite him to dinner? You know what we have a tendency to do is we make exceptions for people that are extreme. In our hearts, we just really say to ourselves, man, they're beyond the reach of God. They're beyond the power of grace. Why do we allow our disdain, our hate, for someone to override the spiritual compassion that the gospel bubbles in us why do we allow our hate for someone to overpower the gospel, this compassion that God has given us for the least and the unlikely? Do you know when we're going to know the gospel is taking root in us? Do you know when we're really going to know that we are spiritually being transformed in the character and likeness of Christ? When we begin to engage with those who are most unlikely for us. When we're willing to move toward them and include them and accept them and love them, we're going to know that's when the work of the gospel is taking place because it will be beyond our own ability. Folks, too often as followers of Christ, we play a safe life. We play it safe. And as followers of Christ, we are to live spiritually risky lives for the sake of those who are far from God. What does that mean for us? By having a meal with tax collectors and sinners, Jesus shows us who is in the kingdom. Do you know the thing we forget? We were at one time that unlikely person. We were rebellious. We were apathetic. We were resistant. We were that person. 
And Jesus invited us to the table. All right, let me close with something very practical for us as a church. What does this look like then? What does this look like? It's going to be hard for us to move all the way out there from the beginning. So we say, just say, all right, let's back up. Let's just take the first step out of our own little holy huddle and move toward people that we already know and already love and already care about. Let's make ourselves uncomfortable for the sake of those people that we already are interested in. A couple weeks ago, Steve explained to us this new paradigm for small groups called third place, third place. And this third place is part of this new paradigm for small groups. Let me show you. We'll put it up here. That in, in my small group meets on Monday nights. So, for instance, the first and third Monday nights, we would have our study. We're going through the Gospel of Mark right now. We're following the church and going through the Gospel of Mark. So the first and third, we get together and we talk and we get in the Word together and we wrestle with what we believe the Scripture is saying and understanding what, what is in, in the text. And then on the second week, we have a family meal. And, and the third place is not your family meal. A family meal is when we get together at someone's house and over a meal, we talk about spiritual things. We talk about something that bubbled up that we didn't have time to address in our small group. Or we talk about some other issue, and we talk about it and wrestle with it. What does God have to say about this particular subject? But that fourth week, that fourth week up there is the third place. Now, what do I mean by third place? What I mean is it's not the church and it's not your small group. It's some other place. You're looking for something that is natural and neutral. And what do we mean? What would happen in third place is that you would bring those that are part of your faith community, your small group, and then all of us would invite those people we already love and already care about and already engaged with to join us. And then we mix naturally. We just talk about life together naturally. And one of the things that will happen is that your friends will meet other followers of Christ and realize you're pretty normal. Because they like sports and they like IPA beer and they like various other things just like your friend over here who's far from God likes. And they're going to find out that we're all pretty normal. And we have this chance together then to have spiritual conversations because why? We're talking about things that are good news to us. And I'm going to hear what's good news to them and they're going to ask me and I'm going to share what's good news to me. And we're going to be able together in a non-threatening context be able to talk with a low risk around spiritual things. Let me show you and give you some examples of what this looks like. We'll put them up here. A running club, movie in the park or concert in the park, wine tasting, a Super Bowl party. You'll have plenty of time to talk at the Super Bowl party because the bears will not be in it. <laughs> a dog park, your college or pro team sports bar. You know, a number of you all went to the same university. You know, you go and you hang out there. Beach volleyball, neighborhood park with your kids, a dinner party, a barbecue, a game night, the opening of a movie like Star Wars. Man, you just get a bunch of people because a lot of people are interested in this particular event. You serve together. You serve together. Or you just have those things that happen in life, an engagement party. Or you're disclosing the sex of your unborn child and you invite a bunch of people over and so you invite, it's a third place. All these natural places for us, we just invite people to come and be a part. Let me add one more suggestion to you, and this is really Trevor's, and I love what he does. He does these things called unfiltered conversations, where a bunch of people get together, and they talk about very significant issues, and they ask questions of each other, and they listen to each other, and they share, and hopefully through these conversations, everybody kind of moves a little bit in this process. You find a neutral setting for this, and you kind of let people know ahead of time, hey, here's what we're going to talk about, and you kind of roll it out, and then someone needs to facilitate that conversation. And if you're interested in that, Trevor will be right down here at the end of the service to be happy to talk to you about it, or you can email him. There's his email address right there. He'd be happy to talk to me. He's done a number of these, and so he knows how to do these things and be more than willing to coach us on how to do it. Folks, you know what's interesting? A lot of, in, of us in this room belonged before we believed. A lot of us in this room belonged. We joined a community long before we ever believed in Jesus. We didn't walk in the front door of the church. We came through the side door. We met someone who invited us to work out and to train for the marathon. We went to Ultimate Frisbee and we met some Christians there. 
We went to a party and we met some Christians there and we found out these are good people and they care about me and they talk to me and they ask questions about me and they're interested in what I think. Many of us did not come in the front door of the church. We came in through the side door and we belonged to a community long before we ever believed. That's the third place. So here's the question. Who? Where? When? Who needs to be invited to this third place? Where are you going to hold it? And when are you going to do it? Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your kindness to us that we were invited to a table we had no right to. There was a time when every follower in Christ in here was unlikely. And we thank you that your grace moved toward us and invited us and has drawn us into this relationship. And thank you that now we have a privilege to be your ambassador and to communicate this incredibly great news to other people. May we be courageous to take the step. And would you give us wisdom in knowing what to say. In Jesus' name we pray.